I'm Eric Messerschmidt. I'm here to talk about devotion. Welcome to the Go Creative Show. Hello and welcome to the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Eric Messerschmidt, ASC, the Director of Photography for Devotion. Now, we love having Eric on the show. He's been on many, many times, and for good reason. He's an incredible cinematographer. He has awesome projects, and he's great on the air. And you guys love having him because you ask questions, and we have a couple of audience questions in this episode as well. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And also, if you're listening to the podcast, that's great, and we love that. But you can also see the interview by going to our YouTube page and subscribing to us there. So all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. You can get your links to everywhere you need to go. I really appreciate all the support, and I am so excited to share this interview with you. So let's get to it. Eric Messerschmidt, thank you so much for coming back on the Go Creative Show. You're, we were saying before we started recording, you're you're the returning champion. You've been on for <laughs> so many projects. Now, now I need to look. I'm going to look because you've been on multiple times. So you obviously like talking to our audience. <laughs> I, I love you guys. I love being here. Thanks for having me, of course. Well, you're on today for Devotion, which was such a great film. And like, honestly, well, first of all, I'm curious. Do, how do you feel about the comparison that everyone is making to Top Gun? It feels like that's all anybody, anytime anyone talks about this movie, it's like, oh, it's like blah, 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 Top Gun. It's like Top Gun, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's constantly being compared to it for obvious reasons, but it doesn't seem like it makes any sense. Like there's really no reason to make the comparison except for the fact that we're in fighter jets. Yeah. Well, you know, when we were making the movie, we knew about Top Gun, obviously, and, and Claudia Miranda is a good friend of mine, and he had been shooting Top Gun, and, and we said, well, maybe we're going to be compared to Top Gun. But when we were making the film, you know, Top Gun was supposed to premiere like a year before our film was meant to come out. So everyone thought, well, you know, Glenn Powell's in it, but it, they'll, they'll be so far apart, it won't matter. Uh, and then, of course, COVID and and top gun waiting waiting a year to come out and all of a sudden our our film is 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 uh is out in the world uh, around the same time and, and it's you know it's kind of a um it's it's a little bit ser serendipitous i guess but um i don't know i mean i you know our film is about fighter pilots but it's it's really not an action film you know yeah. it's a drama and it's it's really meant to be a drama and it's it's meant to be um it's meant to be experienced as a drama and uh, not, not to not any criticism of, of, of the dramatic moments in Top Gun, but they're, you're right. They're very different movies. You it's know? a totally so, um, different movie. Yeah. It's just, I think people just like the clickbait of having Top Gun in their, in their articles. <laughs> so they right. throw it in there, but it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's just such a different film and it's, it's really just a fantastic film. And I think like one of the things that strikes me the most is obviously just the look of it. You have such a, there's so much moodiness in that look. And I'd love to obviously talk about that. I mean, it's Go Creative Show, sure. so we're certainly going to talk about that. But I want to talk just, I want to go one step back and ask you, because we've had you on so many times now, but I don't think I've ever asked you, like, when you first get this script, what was your initial thought about how it should look? And was that initial thought something that was actually realized, or did it change over time? It changed. I mean, I, you know... I try, I'm not always successful at it, but I try um, to really spend those, those first moments just listening to the director about what it is they want their movie to look like. You know, um, in fact, sometimes I don't, I'd rather have a conversation with the director before I read the script in many cases, you know, it's like almost better to have a little bit of subtext and, and to read it um, with, um, with uh, context. I mean, you know, from the, from the director's perspective so that you can kind of, if, you know, if the seed is planted in your brain about what they're looking for and it doesn't have to be specific, you know, it could be just, it could be an abstract idea. It could be music or be whatever. Um, that didn't happen on this film, but I, I do think that it's, it's easy to read a script and then fall into, fall into the trap of, Oh, well, it should look this way. And then you get deep into the conversations about with the director about what the film is meant to be and sometimes they're in opposition you know to what you initially felt um that that didn't really happen though on this movie i, I got the script first i read the script and it felt it was written like a um 
like a nineties kind of, you know, epic film, you know, it was written like a movie that, you know, maybe you and I would have grown up watching when we were, you know, kids or, or teenagers, you know? And, and when I met with JD and he said, look, I want it to be, I want it to, to feel like a period film, but written shot through sort of a modern lens. And how do we do that? And so we had conversations about color and composition and, and pace and, and, um, and structure, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was worried. I didn't want, I didn't want the film. Neither of us really wanted the film to feel, um, derivative of other war films. You know, it didn't, we, was like, you know, JD said, I, in, in one of our initial conversations, he said, I, I want it to be more Shawshank Redemption than Saving Private Ryan, mm. you know? Um, so, so we, you know, we spent a lot of time watching movies that we liked that we thought were representative of sort of the story we were trying to tell. And we talked about what we liked and what we didn't like specifically aesthetically, but also conceptually. And, you know, uh, just in terms of like grammatical structure of storytelling, like, you know, kind of abstract ideas. And how do you communicate um, that? Like, how 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 would you even explain the look of this film? Well, I don't know. I you know it's it's hard. I I I love lookbooks. I love photo reference. Personally, I mean, I think it's 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 so easy to say take a picture like 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 this, right? Like you want it to look kind of like this. Um, and that's easier than articulating, oh, well, it should have a little bit of muddiness in the blacks and it should be, you know, it should have a green split tone. And, you know, it's sort of, especially if directors haven't spent a lot of time in a, in a grading suite or, you know, it's like, it's, you're going to have a very detailed conversation like that with someone like David Fincher, for example, but, but, uh, but a director who, who maybe doesn't have that much color grading experience, you sort of have to be more, um, it, it, it helps to have, have just more, more visual reference, I think, you know? Um, but I, you know, the, the movie, you know, it's meant to be this kind of, it's, it's, we, we went and scouted all of the, you know, we went and looked at army barracks. We looked at, uh, uh, aircraft carriers, you know, uh, the, the kind of the bellies of aircraft carriers. We looked at cockpits. We looked at, you know, really where these pilots lived. And then we looked at a lot of historical photographs, um, and, 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 um, and film as well. And we just tried to absorb the kind of tone and the, and the, the feeling of what those places must have felt like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then the production designer and, and JD and I, the director sat down and we said, well, kind of like this, right. Or a little bit like that. And, um, that's kind of where the, the look of the film came from. And, and, you know, we, we, initially we built a, a kind of a LUT for the movie and, and we, we shot the movie under that LUT and then we got into the grade and we pushed a little further. It was like, God, maybe we can be more aggressive. And, you know, so it's, it's probably the, the, the heaviest grade of anything I've done. It's definitely graded film, you know? Um, but I really enjoyed it. It was, you know, it's fun to kind of take, take everything a little bit of a step further, you know? That's interesting to hear because you don't look at it and think to yourself, this is heavily graded. It, it just, oh, that's good. <laughs> it, you really don't. Like, I mean, there are certain things where, you know, people that are in the industry for sure, and even just film enthusiasts would look at and think, okay, they, you know, they push the yellows, they push the greens. That This has a very natural look, but, but I think it's, it's like, it's colorless in a way. It's like, it's close sure. to black and white as you can be without actually pulling the trigger. And I thought that was such a great choice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we wanted it to sort of feel like it had a, a limited palette, you know? And so and a lot of that comes through production design, honestly, and costumes. You know? So it's, you know, the, the costumes in particular are such dramatic, you know, it's these, it's these deep olives and these grays and the beige, you know, the kind of um, navy beige, navy blue. And, um, and, and it was always making sure that the, that the costumes uh, contrast with the background tone. So we, you know, uh, we talk about what are they what are they wearing when they're down in the belly of the ship? Okay, great. So what's the color of the wall, and how do we separate them? So I don't have to do so much lighting. You know, it was a it was a real collaborative effort amongst all of us to make sure that it had, you know, you know it all came from a place of intent. One of the things that Devotion's being hailed for so much is the fact that you relied so little on visual effects and so much on practical effects. So I want to talk to you about that, about that decision, what that meant for the filmmaking, and how you think that enhanced the film overall. Sure. I, you know, we, when I first read the script and met with JD, I, I, I said, okay, 
to myself, I, I was like, oh man, this is going to be just a visual effects laden thing. You know, we're going to shoot, we're going to have shooting plates and they'll put CG planes in the air. And I, and the first meeting I said, well, you know, I, I said, what do you think? I said, well, I, I think it's great. Inter- it's a great story. I'm really interested. Are we, are you just going to get a bunch of CG planes and put them up in the air? We're going to, so no, 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 we're going to do it for real. And I said, oh, okay. That's more interesting. <laughs> were you excited by uh, that? Or did you also kind of get I a pit in your stomach? I was, yeah, I mean, I was, but you know, it's, I, I, hard, aerial, aerial photography is hard and it's, um, I mean, it's like shooting race cars, but now you're in three dimensions, you know, and, and, and you, um, and the crew is, is generally the pilots and the crew too. And it's, and it's not me, you know, I'm, I'm, I've spent a little bit of time in helicopters. I've shot establishing shots and simple car work and, you know, um, but to do, anything really elaborate you need people that are that specialize in that kind of work and that are trained to use an ejection seat and you know so we're we're very fortunate to have mike fitzmaurice and kevin larosa um who who uh had done top gun actually um and uh and they they headed up the aerial unit so we you know we spent a lot of time with them discussing how we wanted these sequences to work and what you know what the screen direction was what shots cut with what and you know we because the thing that was important to JD was let's not make this just don't go up in the air and shoot a bunch of plain, plain candy, eye candy, and then bring the footage back and then make us assemble sequences around it. Let's make these sequences feel like they're, um, they're designed. So, um, so the shots make sense in terms of storytelling, that the storytelling is clear and, and concise. Uh, Cause we didn't want it to be too cutty. You know, we didn't want the film to feel like it was, frenetic and confusing and i think that's a kind of a problem these days in cinema honestly is you have uh you know particularly in action films but but in general you you have the audience is often dor- disoriented in terms of where everything is you know it's like i sometimes i watch you know, kind of big big action movies big superhero movies or whatever and i say where is spider-man like where i thought he was over there and now the guy's ahead of him and i'm confused you know so we didn't want that at all. We wanted to be very, we wanted the audience to really understand where these guys are in 3D space because it's so important for the pilots to understand where they are. You know, it felt like it really important for the, um, for the audience to kind of be with them in their, in their experience, you know? Uh, so, so we, you know, we designed sequences. We gave, we gave shot lists to the, to, to Mike and, and, and Kevin and, they went up with the pilots and they did their pre pre flight briefings. And they said, okay, we're going to put three planes here. We're going to put the camera here. We're going to get that shot. And then you guys are going to dive. And we're going to get that shot. And then you guys are going to be in four. And we're, you know, um, and, uh, and then it was all about just scheduling everything around the right time of light, you know, and making sure that the right backgrounds are, in, you know, and it's, it was a, it was a major, it was a major endeavor, uh, and much more complicated and much, much more costly than just going up and shooting some quick plates and putting CG planes in. But I think, I think the, the results are, totally worth it, you know, in the end. When you think about where to mount cameras on a plane, um, it, there has to be some, I mean, I'm sure this was obviously led by your aerial team, but were there situations where you wanted a camera in a certain spot, it just simply couldn't be there, or you had to make accommodations? Like, what, was there any sort of um, changes that were made because of just the logistics of being actually up in the sky? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was honestly, they were so cool about it. I mean, the pilots, all these planes are kind of what they, you know, what they would call the experimental, you know, they are, uh, there are very few of them left in the world. They're, you know, they're all antiques. They are all exquisitely maintained. Um, and the pilots were really, you know, they had last say about where we could put the cameras. When I showed up with a Komodo the first day. And because we said, well, we want to talk about mounting cameras. And they said, well, <laughs> I don't know. You know, there's only a couple places where you can put a camera. I said, well, let me bring it. And I brought the Komodo and, uh, you know, the pilots took one look at it. And they said, oh, you pr- put that pretty much anywhere you want. You know, mm-hmm. I said, really? They said, yeah, these things are designed to carry bombs, man. It's fine. Uh, particularly the Corsairs and, and the Skyriders, you know, these are big aircraft and they're strong. Um, and, and the Corsairs, except for the, the, um, control surfaces are all aluminum skin, you know, it's not, it's not like they're covered in fabric. And so they're, um, so they were, they were really accommodating and we put them all over the plane and we put them in the, uh, on the wings, on the wing tips, on the, on the tail, we put them underneath looking at the landing gear and the drop, you know, the drop hook, we put them 
on the nose looking forward, on the nose looking back. We put them on the side, you know, kind of basically hostess tray mounts. And we had, we had cameras all over those airplanes. And, um, and in many cases, three or four cameras at a time. Uh, you know, I called Jared Land at Red and I said, hey, man, the Komodo had just come out. I said, I, I, I've got this movie. We're going to, I'm going to, I think I can mount Komodos all over this, uh, all over this plane, but, you know, I, there's only a couple Komodos. Can you get me more? And he said, well, when you shoot, I said, in, in a month and a half. And he's like, oh, give me a month and a half. And a month and a half later, six Komodos showed up. Wow. Go ahead. Have, you know, go for it. And, and we stuck them all over those planes. Did you lose any? We didn't, but, you know, we did. We had one, uh, they, we we had one mounted to the tail one day. It was the first time we had done that shot, and it was meant to get the the, the landing gear. And we sent it up. We, you know, you had to roll the camera on, gr- on the ground, and then the plane takes off, and it might not, you know, it might fly for an hour or whatever. It comes back, and, uh, and the 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 airplane landed. We were really excited to see the footage because it's a really cool angle, and uh, the plane landed, and the, and the the camera was completely covered in oil and and un- unburned jet fuel. I mean, just dripping. Oh no. And, uh, oh no. And we, you know, we wiped it off and, and it was fine. Actually, the camera was totally fine. The lens was just soaked. It was like, you know, it was, fortunately it wasn't seawater. Um, and, uh, and we cleaned it off and then we went and got a, um, you know, those rubber dog bowls that they sell at hardware stores. Like if you're going to take your dog hiking or whatever, you know, yeah. collapses, we got one of those and they stuck it on the front of the lens and ran a bicycle cable up into the cockpit, like a, like a brake cable for a bike. We'd roll the camera on the ground with the with the uh, with the the dog bowl on the lens, and it's you know just dripping fuel and oil all over the all over while the plane's in the air. And then right before we needed the shot, when the plane is landing, the, the the pilot pulls the cable and the dog bowl pops off the front of the lens, and we get forty or fifty seconds before it gets covered in oil again. We did oh, that wow. you know all of the time. Yeah, so a lot of stuff like that. You know, it was, it was a it was a it was a real uh, hard, it was a hardware store hardware store movie. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> how were how were you monitoring these scenes? Like, did you get clean wireless signals for all no, those cameras? I, we did. You know, there's a sequence in the in the beginning of the film when when Glenn Powell and Jonathan Majors fly uh, the Bearcats. We call it the Bearcat sequence, and it's the it's the kind of the first time we see them up in the air, and it's it's quite an elaborate scene. You know, they they're doing the slalom thing through these sailboats, and it's kind of a um, it's our first introduction to aviation in the film. And we did that for real. They're actually up in the airplanes in that oh, scene. Wow. Um, we had a two seater aircraft. With the, uh, it was like a trainer basically. So the, the actors could sit in the back and then we could put a stunt pilot in the front and they could do, I mean, we could do loops and all that stuff. Uh, and for that, uh, we were in a helicopter because the actors are acting. We were in a helicopter. We get close with the helicopter and actually received the wireless signal. And that was pretty fun. Everything else was was essentially roll, roll the camera and, and and pray and you know and some you know it's it's hard you know you you're on you're on a tarmac somewhere and and, uh, and you have to kind of you know take your light meter set the exposure and uh, where are you guys going oh two hundred kilometers that way okay cool how's the weather there and hope that it's the same um, and we were pretty lucky you know we, you be a little conservative and, and we we were pretty fortunate but. You never really know, you know, sort of like roll the camera and then see what you get when you come back. What a strange like schedule for that day. Cause you probably, I mean, you're just waiting and you wait for them to do their thing. They come back and then you, I'm guessing you're monitoring at, well, not monitoring, but you're reviewing as it comes that same day before you decide yeah. to move on. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the way it works is they do a, they, it's, it's very much like a, like a Navy brief, you know, you, uh, kind of a pre-flight check and this is what we're going to do. And, you know, pilots are, are, you know, they're always safety is the top priority always. And, 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 and pilots are such good communicators. I mean, the movie business has a lot to learn from aviation, I think. Really? Uh, cause they sit down in a meeting, the person in charge, you know, in this case it was Kevin lays out the plan. You know, we're going to get this shot. We're going to get this shot and this shot in this order. We're not going to mess around. We're not going to freelance. We're going to get these shots. And, uh, and it's kind of like a football play. You know, the pilots get themselves in position, the, the camera ship or whatever gets itself in that position. They execute the shot. If they felt like it was good, they move on. If they feel like they need another one, they do it again. Um, and then, you know, the, the planes land, you look at it and you basically look at it in the order that you discuss, you know, and they, it's a sortie. I mean, it's all the kind of Navy terminology, you know, so that they, they go up, they fly a sortie, they come back, you review the footage. That's good. That's good. I wish this was better. Can we improve this? Let's do this again in the afternoon light, et cetera. 
And then you go up again and we, you know, we were usually getting two or three sorties a day. So, you know, it, it's tedious. Uh, and for the vast majority of it, you know, we were shooting first unit photography in many cases at the same time. Mm. So, so we would, you know, have these zoom calls or conference calls afterwards. How'd you guys do? Did you get anything good today? Oh, well, we got this, we got this, we got snow in the afternoon. We're going to try again. And then we'd get the dailies posted online and we would review oh cool look what you got and, you know but it's hard because the camera might be rolling for an hour you know yeah. and you sort of have to scrub through and you get that and, you know there's no script supervisor in the in the in the jet with them so you just kind of it's a lot of, it's a lot of assistant editing for sure i can imagine was there a particular scene uh, a particular aerial scene that really struck you it was challenging it was rewarding it gave you some additional you know filmmaking lessons was there something you can point to that was very memorable for you. I think, you know, the last, the last sequence in the final act when the, um, uh, when, when Jonathan has just crashed and, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then Glenn decides to take his plane down with him. You know, there was, yeah, uh, I'm, that. So, I'm so glad you brought this scene up because <laughs> it's that it was, I mean, the film is great. It's, it's a drama, like you were saying. So it's a different. It's a different pace. It's not an action film. That shot was like, what did I just see? Yeah. That was like <laughs> absolutely incredible. And anyone that has seen the film, you know the one that we're talking about. Um, it, it's just it's phenomenal. So I'm really glad that you're going to talk about this one right now because I want to know. Uh, sure. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we. You know, the, it was really important to JD that we feel the 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 setting sun and we feel that the the day is is waning. And, uh, and, you know, for cinematography, when you read a script and you see the word dusk, it's a and panic immediately sets in, you know, it's an elaborate sequence. It, it, you know, it starts with these guys circling in the planes and there's aerial, there's aerial footage that had to be shot. There's cockpit footage that had to be shot on stage. There's location work post crash that had to be shot and all had to be kind of timed in the right time of day. And it was challenging. Um, and, uh, I, but the, but the shot that we're talking about is, is the one where we take glenn down and it's it's a oneer that's where it starts as an aerial and it's an aerial it's not a vfx shot it's the plane is is in profile we push in on the on the on the camera aircraft and then the motion control rig takes over and we end up with glenn and the camera goes down with glenn as if it's mounted to the plane all the way down to the ground to where it crashes um and then the operator takes the camera off the plane and and follows Glenn to to Jonathan's to to uh, Jesse Brown's crash aircraft. So it's it's quite a long sequence. Um, and uh, but yeah, it's done. It's done essentially as three parts. The magic trick is three parts of two stitches. Um, but it was you know it was something we conceived of over the course of three or four months and discussed with with visual effects team and motion control team and, and stunts and. Um, but it's yeah. So we it's it's a it's an aerial. It's an onstage uh, portion in front of an LED wall, and then we have the 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 final piece. The final stitch is actually Glenn's plane on a on a motion control track on location, and the track you know in two hundred fifty feet of track and a, a full size plane, and it was gone at seventy miles an hour, and it could basically crash through the snow, and we could do it repeatedly. Um, so it looks yeah, fun. so good and so real and especially too cuz it's you know it's basically the end of the movie so you've already had this experience of the realism of the film and you watch that and you're like there's no way this is done practically but you kind of think to yourself like maybe it was cuz so cuz so <laughs> much of it was like it really was just it, it was just spectacular so walk me oh, through the the landing part so you said it's done in three parts there's two stitches yeah. three parts Walk me through kind of what what was what. So that that initial that initial landing was so, mounted to the wing. Yeah. So the, the we had a we had a, a full size plane. Um, it wasn't a real Corsair, but it was a it was a um, a buck essentially with one with one wing and a fuselage and a tail section and a cockpit and a functional um, um, canopy. And the, the, the camera is mounted to the wing and it had, uh, so we shot that, we shot the aerial shot first, then we shot that shot second. And so we were able to line up on the wing exactly where we wanted the camera and what the, what the shot was. Um, and then the, the aircraft is on a track 
uh, you know, we put fake snow all over the track and, you know, we could just pull the pull back cable and they could pull it, you know, as fast as we want it. And Glenn is in the, is in the track and, and he crashes the plane, gets out of the plane and the operator disconnects the rig and walks with him all the way to Jonathan's plane across the field. Uh, which is exactly what happened in real life, by the way. That's, you know, they, they landed about that far apart. They landed in opposite directions. He had to walk. So it's historically quite accurate. Um, in fact, the, even the distance is pretty accurate. Um, but, uh, but yeah. And, and so Brian Osmond, the operator is waiting there and, you know, it was going to land exactly where it was motion control. So it, you know, it within an inch or so of where it was meant to be. And he just waited for the camera and Jim Shelton, the grip is waiting there with him and they, they go and they, as Glenn gets out of the plane, they disconnect the camera and he, you know, lands in his hands and he takes it with him. Oh, it's just, yeah. it's just so cool. And especially since just before that, you saw a somewhat unsuccessful landing. I mean, he landed, but the, the plane went yeah. up in flames. So you kind of have a perspective that was only five minutes ago. Once again, you can see another, it, it's just so well done. I mean, a standout scene from the film for sure. No, oh, thank you. It was awesome. Um, we talked a little bit about camera package. Um, you said you were shooting on the red kimono. Was that for the entire film, or were you just doing that for the aerial sequences? We just did. We just did the mounts on the kimono. The um, the aerials were shot on the Sony Venice. Well, like the aerials in the in the in the remote head. So okay. on the helicopter on the Cinejet, which is a it's a it's a it's a acrobatic airplane called an L thirty nine. It's been modified to take a take a shot over a remote head, so it, it can do acrobatic stuff with the blue angels with our planes with f-18s whatever um and uh so we had that we had that camera ship we had a a, a helicopter um and that that portion was all sony venice and the principal photography was all showed shot on the um on the on the uh, dxl the panavision dxl so and then we had a little bit of red um red monstro as well so it's primarily i would say 80 to 90 percent of the movie was shot on the dxl now you were saying that it was the most heavily graded film of yours, but um, what about filtration? Did you experiment, play with any sort of filters on these lenses? We experimented a little bit. You know, the the, the lenses are all custom. They're Panaspeeds, Panavision Panaspeeds, but Dan Sasaki Panavision modified them. And I went to him uh, uh, five months before we we started shooting, and I said, "Listen, Dan, I want uh, I want I want to shoot I want to shoot large format." Um, I want, uh, I need, I need spherical aberration, but no chromatic aberration. I need some barrel distortion. I want the film. I want the lenses to have a little bit of a, a vintage feel, but I need them to kind of flare consistently. And he said, okay, cool. Give me three weeks. And, uh, I came back three weeks later and he had two lenses done and they were pan speeds. We threw them up on the projector and I said, oh, that's kind of cool. And he showed me what he had done and he had moved certain elements inside and shifted some stuff inside and manipulated the iris blades and, you know, doing all the dance of sake magic that he does. And, um, I said, yeah, this, this totally works. And, and, uh, another three weeks later, he had another eight lenses, another three weeks later, he had the rest of the package. And, um, so we didn't really need any, any diffusion actually, because the lenses had so much kind of inherent softness in them already. Do you prefer that? Like, would you, it, in perfect world for you, customize your lens versus adding filtration to make those adjustments? Yeah, generally. I mean, I like filtration, I, I but I, I sometimes, sometimes it feels a little bit like a parlor trick to me, you know? Uh, I, I generally, I just sort of, anything on the camera just bothers me. You know, it's like, oh, you need filtration, then you need a matte box, then you need, you have to be worried about flares because then you get double reflection. You know, it's like, any additional stuff, uh, I, I find there's, there's a, there's a cost benefit thing that, that I struggle with a little bit. Um, I mean, I like to play with filtration, but I would prefer to do it with atmosphere or with, or with optics as, as opposed to, you know, a piece of glass generally. Um, but I do use it on occasion, you know, if I feel like the, the scene needs it or, or whatever, you know, in Fargo, we used a lot of filtration and it's fine. I mean, it's sort of, I guess it's sort of kind of story specific. Yeah. Let's talk about the two kind of different visual worlds in devotion. Um, I guess the first question is, do you agree? It feels like there is, but there's the military life and the family life. And they seem to me very distinctive. I said probably maybe the one place where they blend is in France, 
But mm-hmm. aside from that, they have they have very distinct looks. Um, you know, in the in the character portrayals, in the acting, the body language is different. It's just everything is different when you have the military life and the home life. Can you talk to me about that? Am I am I just sure. seeing things, or is that is that actually there? And what are you doing, and why? No, I think you're you're absolutely right, I, and that was intentional. I, you know, it was a it was a it was a character development thing, really, coming from JD and and Jonathan Majors saying, look, the the, the Jesse's Jesse's work life, Jesse's military life is is Jesse having to deal with all the pressures of being a, an African American in this culture having to uh, make sure that he conforms with the Navy, but making sure that he's true to himself. And how does, how does Jesse as a character, you know, interact with his, with his comrades? Um, and, and what does that environment look like? Yeah, w- that, that was always meant to be a very distinctly different character representation than Jesse at home with his wife, you know, with, with Daisy, with, um, with Pam, you know, even Jesse, uh, uh, you know, any, anytime Jesse is is out of his out of his military element, he's a softer, kind of easier going, um, less less stern character. You know, um, and so and and that was something that JD was it was very clear about from the beginning, and and um, and so we just we talked about different ways to do that, and one of the things we talked about was that. When we are in, in, in Jesse's house, maybe that's the time in the film, except for a couple of the battle sequences where, where we shoot handheld and where the film, it just feels a little bit more intimate and less formal and less structured. You know, the movie in general is, is quite structured. Um, and, and that felt like a place where we could break that rule a little bit and it could be, a, it could be a little softer, you know, and then the lighting and the, you know, and the color is the same, you know, Wynn Thomas was, the, you know, the colors in, in the house and the colors in France are brighter and softer and less, less monochromatic and you know and the lighting is is less dramatic etc so it's it was all kind of coming from that idea of well what are these two how does how does jesse's character change depending on his on, on where he is you know were there any changes to the lens package or focal lengths or anything like that in addition to just being handheld in those moments that helped support this kind of uh, theme of family life versus work life no, I don't think so. I think it was, I, I we, you know, there, there's sort of less coverage, I guess you might say, in the, you know, in the house stuff. And it's probably because it's handheld and we, we, the, the camera was just more free so we could move it. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I think it was, you know, the handheld felt like enough, I think, for us. Um, you know, we, we sort of, we shot, kind of shot the movie on three lenses. I mean, it was like, you know, 40, 40, 50, 80, 80 mils, you know, it was like those three lenses. I think we shot the whole movie on basically. Hmm. Uh, and what is it about those focal lengths that worked for this? Is it something about that? You know, is it something about those focal lengths that are better for drama? Um, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, I think, I think it's important to kind of define at least the way I like to work. And it's like, look, there's hundreds of ways to make movies and it's by, by no means, um, am I preaching that this is better than anyone else's, but I, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's important to define what does a close up look like in our film? Mm. You know, what does a medium shot look like in our film? What is a, um, do we use medium shots? Do we, do we do, is that, is that part of the grammar of the film? You know, and I like to get into the, get that fractal about, you know, what kind of, how are we going to approach this as a, um, grammatically, in ter- you know, the visual grammar of the movie. Um, and you know, so it's, it's nice to take an 80 millimeter lens, you know, you go on a camera test and you throw an 80 millimeter lens up or whatever, you know, in large format. Uh, up on the up on the camera and, and push into a close up and you get the camera about there or whatever you know depending on how close you think you're going to get on the film and say this so what do you think is this kind of our language and I like those conversations with the director you know if the director is is willing to have that conversation around what is what is a what is representative of, of a close up in our movie and then um, once you kind of understand that it's like, it's like golf, you know, you just, this is the wedge you use when you're this far away, you know, 
this is the nine iron, you know, you use a nine iron when you're, you know, when, if you understand your swing and you know how far you can get the ball, it's, you know, the, the lens choices end up just being kind of reflexive at that point, um, at least for me. Uh, so, you know, it's, and, and, and JD was very up, up for that conversation, you know, and, and so it was, you know, a lot of it too, I think has to do with the sets. And so if you're, you know, if you're in sets where you can pull the wall, sometimes it's better to pull the wall, shoot on a longer lens as opposed to get stuck on an 18 or 21 millimeter lens in the corner, you know, try and include everybody in the shot. Um, and we, you know, that was something we didn't want to do a lot. We didn't want to be pushed into really wide lenses in the corners and sort of tell, tell the story of where people were. It was more about kind of taking a slice of a room and, and, uh, and showing it to the audience that way and then telling it in cuts, you know, the, the, those conversations kind of drove the, the lens choice conversation. I want to talk a little bit more about lighting and your lighting choices for devotion. It's a period piece. So you have, you know, there are certain things you need to do in order for accuracy, but talk to me about that. How, how are you handling, you know, the interiors or exteriors? What's your strategy for lighting uh, devotion? Well, we, you know, we wanted the, the film to feel, period and and be a bit of a throwback to films of our childhood you know um but but we didn't want it to feel glossy really you know we didn't want the movie to feel like you know everyone had backlight and everyone was you know had this kind of um shapely key light on their face you know it, it, we didn't want it to feel that hollywood but we wanted it to feel a little bit hollywood and so you know it was important that we we I knew that I had to light every shot, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so much like we were just kind of lighting the rooms. Um, but, but it was tricky because the, you know, the rooms had, they had solid ceilings. Um, you know, we're in air, we're in aircraft carriers. They're not like eight foot or 10 foot ceilings, you know, like, like this room, it's like, you know, they're seven foot or six foot five, you know, they, they're cramped spaces. And so the yeah. lighting had to be kind of built in um, into the environment. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a lot of practicals, uh, and, and, and smart staging. I think, you know, the actors were, they understood kind of what was going on. You know, the actors we had are trained and they're, they're, um, you know, they're very, they're very, very aware of how the camera and how they need to collaborate with the camera and with the type of filmmaking structure that we were doing. They understood that we had to place marks and rehearse and they had to talk about where they were going to stand and we had to kind of diagram the scenes to some degree and and if the, if i got in trouble you know i say hey can, can you guys move over a little bit so that, that light's behind you and you know there's a scene in the end of the film where um uh after mooring dies uh jesse and and tom have an altercation in the in the bunks and they uh they they have an argument and it ends with a with a kind of 50 50 two shot and then joe jonas comes in and he interrupts them and uh, and they were turning, you know, they're turning around. They ended up in a 50-50. And, and it was a big discussion. I said, hey, can you guys time it so you get a little bit more over here? So we get these other bunks behind you because then you're basically silhouette and I don't have to do anything. You know, if you end up there, then I have to hang all these lights. And you're, you know, we have to be a little bit more. Um, it's going to take more time, basically, you know. And they were, they totally got it. And they said, okay, cool. Let's work it out. Let's figure out how many steps that is. Let's figure out how to time the argument. So we land where you want us to land. And, you know, it's, it's great when that, when that works out, you know, it doesn't always work out like that, but, but it, it, you know, it was a good example of everyone kind of working together and figure it out. Yeah. I was curious about how you were approaching such cramped spaces uh, because there are so many scenes where like you're in the bedrooms, you're in the bunk areas and there's just no room uh, and and you need some depth, obviously, to make it look good, but you also can't make it look too good because it, it doesn't. So it, yeah. it's, it, so like, how do you approach these cramped spaces? I mean, you just mentioned just making sure that lighting is already in the ceiling is one of the techniques, but what are you doing by way of camera motion and just simply placing equipment where it needs to go? Like, <laughs> how are you handling these scenes? Well, you know, we, we went to, we went and looked at, at an aircraft carrier before we started shooting as if it was, you know, as an option to shoot in, uh, and the producers and JD and I, and, the, and when the, the production designer, we all, we all went, there was a, there are actually two, there's one in Charleston, South Carolina, and there was one in, in Jacksonville and they're both floating museums right now. And we went down into these sets and they looked fantastic. They were the right period. You know, they they had, they had, um, they'd taken really good care of them. And, 
it immediately be, became clear when we first came in that there was no way we were going to shoot in a real aircraft carrier because yeah. it's just, it takes forever to move. I mean, just us to get down the ladders and around the corner and get over there. And, you know, the idea of getting, getting a dolly or whatever is, was, was just not, not, not realistic and nothing moves, you know? So, so we built them, we built the interiors and, and it, it made it substantially easier because we could pull a wall and then you could remove the, the bunks and, and, you know, make some space for us, you know? Uh, so that, that helped, but, um, you know, it, it's, it, it was important, I think for the film in general to feel like it, for the, the audience to feel this kind of compression and expansion thing of what it's like to be in an aircraft carrier, you know? So you have, um, you know, you have the, you know, everyone is cooped up inside these bunks for, uh, most of the day and then you get out on the deck and the world kind of opens up and that was very much what the characters were going through so you know we wanted the audience to feel kind of cramped and claustrophobic inside the, the carrier can you talk to me about the way that you approached the cinematography and the lighting and the overall look to the scenes in france you know france was that was tricky because we we had such we had developed kind of the look for the movie so early in the prep and it felt very appropriate for the whole movie. And then France, you know, I never, I didn't quite understand when we started where France sat in the film, you know, like where, it, how it, how it was meant to feel. Um, and so when, when we shot it, um, the, we applied the look for the rest of the movie to the dailies and, um, and we started to look at it in editing and, and, and JD and I said, man, I, I'm not sure this is right. You know, it just doesn't quite feel right because it's supposed to be this moment of, of levity, you know, for the characters. And, cool. um, uh, and so we d began experimenting with the grade a little bit. We, you know, we, we lightened it up a little bit and we added some more color and we brought color back in the image and, and, you know, and Wynn had given us all these beautiful kind of rose, rose colored and, you know, pastels and, you know, very kind of, um, French Riviera tones, um, that, that we could, you know, we could pull back into the gray that the, that the rest of the movie would have normally suppressed. And, and so we, you know, we experimented a bunch with different, um, different color tones and, and, you know, we kind of ended up where we ended up, but we, you know, we, we tried stuff. We tried kind of bright Kodachrome looks. We tried, um, uh, you know, really dramatic desaturation. We tried a lot of grain and we just experimented until it, it just felt right. That kind of like an old Hollywood feel, especially the scenes with Elizabeth Taylor, just that, yeah. that casino party vibe thing going on in there. Like it, it just had this really cool old Hollywood look, but set in France. It was kind of, it was a really unique choice. And like you said, a great moment of levity in the film, but it also like just gives you an opportunity as a viewer to just kind of really like these guys, like just, yeah. just enjoy them enjoying their, you know, time there. It was, it was really cool. Yeah. And it really happened by the way, you know, they actually they did stop in Cannes. They did meet Elizabeth Taylor on the beach and they did go to the casino. So that's all true. It's cool. When you're doing something like this, that is, you know, based on a true story, historically accurate, what kind of a, what sort of a responsibility do you feel as a, as a cinematographer, director of photography to stay as true as possible to the story? Oh, I mean, the pressure was immense, you know, I mean, um, particularly for the actors and for JD, but myself as well, you know, we, we, we really, I mean, there's, there's the aviation component and the military component. You want to make sure that you're, you're following procedure and that you're, you know, the, the characters are doing what they would do and that the, um, you know, the movement of the planes and all that kind of stuff is appropriate. And, um, you know, that's less my responsibility and more, you know, the films, but, um, but it's also, you know, the responsibility of making sure that the story is told in a respectful way. I think, you know, the, these are, um, you know, the, the characters have families that are alive that, that have memories of their parents, you know, that, um, where there's, you know, members of the audience that were in the Korean war that are going to have memories of the Korean war and, uh, you know, people whose parents from the Korean War, and so you, you know, I think you feel a lot of. I certainly did a, a tremendous responsibility to make sure you're being respectful and honest about how you're doing it, and and, and you're not exploiting it at all either. You know, is is important. I think for all of us to feel like, um, 
that that if, if we had relatives who had, had fought in the war or 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 had been in the, any of these situations that if they watched the movie they'd be proud you know um, and, so I'm, yeah it was tricky i'm imagining you're getting great feedback from that population of people that are watching it and i mean all the reviews that i'm reading um are, are you know I'm, I'm reading a lot of reviews from like you know military aviation websites strangely enough are giving sure. you guys tons of great reviews uh, as well as just general public too but those reviews are particularly interesting to me because that's where that accuracy is going to be. They're going to appreciate those things. And I feel like overwhelmingly what I'm, what I'm reading, um, because I don't have any experience in that, in that field, nor does my family, but it seems like you stayed as true as possible. There's an accuracy to it. There's a respect for that time period in, in, um, you know, aviation in general, of course, the Korean war. Are you hearing that? And if you are, I mean, how does that make you feel? Oh, it's, it's great. I mean, that was our biggest worry was just making sure that members of the, um, members of the armed forces and that, you know, the, the families would, would appreciate what it, what it was that we did, you know? And, I mean, you know, one of the things we, we talked about just from a photography standpoint was making sure that we only ever put the cameras in places where you could actually put a camera on an airplane. Mm -hmm. So even when we were shooting and the plane wasn't actually in the sky and we, we couldn't shoot every sequence, um, where the planes were actually flying, you know, so we never wanted to have the kind of chitty chitty bang bang sequence of the, you know, the, the, the techno crane shot flying around the cockpit thing. You know, we didn't yeah. want to, we never wanted to do that. Um, you know, we wanted it to, we wanted it to feel as authentic as possible in, in every, in every respect. So, you know, it's, you know, and it's great. It's great to get that. I mean, I, I much prefer that feedback than members of the, you know, members of the uh of the film community you know it's nice to get that because that's that's kind of who we made the movie for to be honest you know we've got a question from uh one of our listeners fan of fincher on instagram wants to know what did shooting on the volume teach you <laughs> um shooting on the volume uh shooting, shooting the volume is great it's really cool um for certain things and uh and not so cool for other things, you know, it's like anything else. It's, it's, um, I loved it. You know, I, I loved it for, for what it was we needed to do. It was, it was I don't think there was a, a, there was a better solution. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it, I think nowadays everyone is sort of, they lean on the volume as the catch all solution. And it really isn't, you know, it's still you know, cinema is, is foreground against the background. Right. So the, so the volume is great for that, but it, it uh you know there are limitations to how much you can move the camera how much you can move the actors within the space how the space needs to react it's you know it, it can be it can get complicated quick unfortunately for our work it was it was quite simple you know the plane was on a motion base and it couldn't move and it was stuck was stuck in the center of the volume and we could put the, the background up and it was you know it was relatively simple um but uh but you know i i don't think it's the it's the it's the catch-all solution that everyone is, is not everyone, but a lot of people are calling it these days. It does seem like, you know, once the Mandalorian dropped, that's all anybody wanted to talk about. And, you know, people certainly still use it. Once it started trickling down to productions of my size, then you start hearing a lot more people talk about the limitations. It's weird. It was like the, the talk about the limitations didn't come out until more people started using it, which I guess is natural. But then all of a sudden people are like, yeah, you know, I tried it and it's a little disappointing because I couldn't move as fast as I wanted to or there were just things started popping up. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, look, people forget that it's not a new idea at all. You know, I mean, Hitchcock did it in To Catch a Thief. Really? It's, yeah. I mean, if you look at any of the driving stuff in To Catch a Thief, it's all rear projection, right? It's all, uh, I, got yes, Grace I, Kelly. Guess, I guess in, right. you're right. It's sort of the next evolution yeah. of rear projection. Yeah. So he went out, they went out and shot plates. He said, I'm going to put the camera here. And they, you know, he said, okay, cool. They shot the plates and they went back to Los Angeles and they put grace on the car and they put the camera on the car and they put the projector in it. You know, look, there's technological advancements since then, but conceptually what's happening is it's, it's ostensibly the same thing, you know, and then Hollywood stepped away from it because people didn't want to do, they didn't, they didn't want to do enough advanced thought to execute that idea. You know, it's, well, it's easier to just put a green screen and then I can decide later, right? I don't have to decide. I can decide later. Oh, that's easier, you know? So everyone does that. And then the volume comes around and everyone's like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I look at it, I'm like, no, what are you guys talking about? We did, we did this 70 years ago, <laughs> you know? Um, 
And just nobody liked it because, you know, look, Lassie is the same idea. Lassie is a painted backdrop, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so for most of those exteriors on stage, you know, um, but it's it's limiting because, you, you know, you have to stage the scenes and you only have this much background and you can't look 360 degrees. So I could personally, you know, in a, like in a discipline idea, I like it because it's it's it brings people back to thinking, OK, I have to put I have to decide where I'm going to put the camera before and then I have to discuss it and I have to plan, you know, um, so, you know, I, I, that to me is great, but, uh, but no, I don't think it's a new idea at all. You know I mean? In fact, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's about as old as, as cinema. What do you think the next new idea is? Like, what's the next frontier in filmmaking? Um, I hope it's better projection in, in, in cinema. So we get people back in the theater. You know, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the advancements of, of, of home television these days, you know, televisions, you know, you got people have home theater projectors. Now they can get for a few thousand bucks that rival the quality of, of cinema projection. You know, you've got, uh, you know, 4k TVs are ubiquitous and every, you know, everyone is watching football in 4k at 86 inches wide or whatever, all over the country. And, um, you know, look, I, I, uh, uh, I'm as big a fan of, of home television as anyone else. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, it's not a criticism at all, but you know, I think it's, I think cinemas have, have to catch up. I mean, I love to watch movies in the cinema, but I think the quality of cinema projection, you know, particularly the quality of the theater experience needs to improve so that people come back. You know, I, uh, I think, you know, you have to make it a better experience, um, than, than, than it is in the living room. And, and personally for me, it's like the, you know, the sound of cinema is great, but the picture needs to catch up. You know, we need, we need higher resolution, uh, uh, projection. We need, uh, you know, screens that have consistent exposure across them. It should be in focus when you go to the theater, et cetera. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that. Cause I think, I think you're right. And I feel like the, the movie theater, you know, companies, I guess, for lack of a better term, are putting their attention on the on all the experiences except for the viewing experience. It's like it's in the seats. It's in they, they're now there's like a little bar in a restaurant in a in a theater. They they'll expand yeah. their you know snack area. They'll make the ticket buying faster. It, it seems like all of the things that are less expensive probably um, are where the focus is. But I think you're right. I think it, you need people to go to the movie. And ultimately, think that the viewing experience was absolutely incredible, um, in order to keep people going back for more. I think, and and I and I agree with you. I don't yeah. think that's where the attention is. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you just don't have. You know, it used to be. You know, when I was a kid, anyway. I I, I mean, I saw Star Wars the first time on a VHS tape. You know, I didn't see Star Wars projected until I was in my twenties. Yeah. You know. Um, and then that was when I first really experienced what it, what, what Star Wars was. So same thing with Close Encounters, you know, it wasn't like, and so I remember, you know, if you wanted the, the premiere cinema experience, you went to the cinema and then you, you know, the movie came out on video and you could, you know, you could watch it at home, but maybe it was Letterboxd, or maybe it wasn't, it was pan and scan, you rent, you know, you rent the VHS. It was a, it was a less, a substantially different level of quality. Now it's sort of, you know, you can sit in your living room with a glass of wine and you can, you can watch something in 4k with surround sound and you have a pretty good experience. And that's great. Um, I just think that, yeah, I think the cinemas need to need to up their game. I think they're lazy. Did you basically. see Avatar? Avatar two. I haven't seen it yet. No, I want to though. I, yeah, I haven't seen it. I mean, the, it, the, it's, it's obviously like stunningly beautiful and the visual effects are unbelievable, but it's like, that's something that you just can't replicate at home. But it's like not every movie is going to be a motion capture 3D experience. It's just, right. it can't be. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I, I want to see it. I, and Russell is a friend of mine. And I, you know, it's, I, uh, I mean, they've worked on it forever, you know, so it's, it's cool. Yeah. He was a great guest. It was, it was, I was happy that he was able to recall so much because so much time has passed uh, in making this movie. Sure. But he he was able to, probably because just he was on a run of press, but uh, going into it before we started rolling, I was like, I'm going to ask you questions you might not remember the answers to because I know you've been filming this thing for 20 years or 15 years or whatever. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's really cool. So what is next for you? Um, what are you excited about? What are you going to be promoting next? I don't know. You know, I just, I... I, I just finished this movie in Italy, um, that, uh, 
that is a little bit under wraps, but it's, it'll, it, you know, hopefully comes out next year and, and that'll be fun. And then, um, uh, I'm going to go to, uh, I'm going to go to a TV pilot in, in, um, in the United States this spring. And, uh, and then we'll see what happens. We'll see, you know, uh, at the moment, at the moment, my, my slate's relatively clean. So, um, so, uh, hope, hoping to open a P touch it soon, but, but I, I don't have anything coming up that, that is, that is pending. I mean, you know, David and I finished this movie, the killer for, for Netflix. I'm psyched for that. Um, yeah, that'll be fun. And, um, we're, you know, we're post now we're grading the film. So, so no release date yet on that one, but, um, that'll be exciting. And so, you know, it's be hopefully next year, a couple of movies I, I, that we've been working on, um, are, are slated to come out, you know, at least in the next year or so. And then, and then we'll see what, we'll see what comes up next. You know, Are you able to enjoy your time off? Or are you the type that gets nervous and you're like, I, I, what am I doing next? I need to know. I need to have it ready to go. I'm, I'm getting much better at it. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, this is, this is now my 21st year in the movie business. So, um, you know, it's, it's taken me this long to kind of turn my phone off and ignore it and, 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 and relax. And, uh, you know, so it's been good. It's, it's good. I, it, it, you know, the, the movie business will take, take everything you give it. So it's, it's, it's important to know when to turn it off. What a great note to end on. I really appreciate it, <laughs> Eric. Thank you so much for coming back on go creative show. We love your work. We love talking to you and, um, really appreciate you returning to talk about your, your upcoming projects. So thank you so much. Of course, of course, Ben, thanks so much for having me always. Yeah. Nice to see you again. I want to thank Eric Messerschmidt ASC for coming back on the show to talk to us about Devotion. If you guys have not seen this film, you simply must. It's so good. It's probably still in theaters by now. I know it's been around for a while, but you'll be able to find it somewhere. Of course, I also want to thank Connor Crosby from IgnitionVisuals.com for producing this show for us. And I want to encourage you all to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, where you can not only hear the episode, but see the episode. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. And of course, you can also follow me at Ben Consoli, C-O-N-S-O-L-I, on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you all for joining us today, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.